I want to tell you a story about music, computer science, and design. This is where I work. Now, I don't just mean Stanford. I work underneath those chimneys, way in the back behind Memchu. <laughs> That's in the Knoll, and that is Stanford's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, CCRMA, Karma. And that's me in my office. I've been here for about 12 years. And uh, well, what is it that I do? I, I build things. I make things. I design. I design programming languages, software, tools, musical instruments, toys, games, and social experiences, all in the service of music and music making. And I do this by writing a lot of code. I love writing code. Code is my craft. I consider it my art. And it's really my tool. And one of my, my ongoing research projects is a programming language called Chuck, which you can use to synthesize sounds, but also to generate music. As Dan mentioned, I direct the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, or SLORC, also the Mobile Phone Orchestra. We are MOFO, Mobile Phone Orchestra. <laughs> um, I also work on music making on mobile devices, as well as more recently, virtual reality for music, asking what does it mean to play music in VR? What are musical instruments? What, are, what would they be like in VR? And what are the artistic, humanistic, and social implications of the medium of virtual reality? Those are the kind of research questions that drive us, and all of this takes design, which is something I want to know, first of all, that it's something that every one of us do. It's just something we humans do. But it's also something that is all around us. I'm going to give you an example of something I designed when I first got here at Stanford. This is an app for your phone. It's called Ocarina. And you uh, play it like this. Keep going. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. How does Ocarina work? Well, it works by blowing into the microphone located at the bottom of the phone. For example, pitch is controlled by the multi-touch screen, and vibrato is controlled by tilting the phone. For example, So this is the design of, of Ocarina. And if you look at the design, it's actually not complex. It was made to be simple. You don't actually see an Ocarina on the screen. You just see the functional parts, the buttons, and also the visualizations of your breath. And there's a very specific reason for that, is that, well, I don't want you to feel like your phone is emulating an Ocarina. I want you to feel that your phone has become and is the Ocarina. Right? I wanted to make the argument that what you're doing is a physical act, and this is a physical artifact. And this is Ocarina in gameplay mode. You can see all the different elements on screen respond to your interactions. It's a way to make this feel furthermore physical. It's an organic thing. The circles that fall down the middle of your screen prompts you as to how to play the next note. This is kind of like Ocarina Hero. But unlike Guitar Hero and Rock Band, the sound is generated right on the device, actually in the aforementioned Chuck programming language. And that means every time you play a song, Ocarina, you get to shape it to be your own. It's a little different every time. So it's both kind of a toy and an instrument, but there's another dimension to Ocarina, and that is a social dimension. In the same app, there is a visualization of a globe on which you can listen to other people around the world blow into their phones. Oh, Shenandoah from the East Coast. Who are these people? Well, in this case, it's anonymous. And that's actually part of the magic, right? This is an app that's designed to not tell you who's on the other side. And that's what makes you wonder. This is an anonymous social network based on music. 
It makes you say, hey, who's that playing Legend of Zelda theme song from Indonesia? I think that question is actually more interesting when you don't answer it and you think about it. Now, if there's an underlying philosophy in the ocarina, it might be this, that technology should create calm. Let's think about this for a moment, right? <laughs> this, this, isn't, this isn't the statement that technology will solve all our problems or technology is going to create wealth. It might do both of those things. Well, I don't know if it will solve all our problems, but this is a, an aesthetic ideal. Is that technology might bring us some kind of inner peace. Example, this is a review left in the App Store for Ocarina 10 years ago. This is my peace on Earth. I'm currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights I may have off, I'm deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that lets you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It is the exact opposite of my life. <laughs> Deployed US soldier. Now, I can tell you that it feels really freaking good when anyone uses something that you've made. But this was on a different level. Something we made brought a moment of peace to another human being. And there's something intrinsically valuable and, and, and good in that. And this is to say that good design enables us. But maybe, just maybe, great design is design that seeks to understand something about who we are, like art. If you think about your favorite song, your favorite movie, your favorite anything, right? I, I don't think these things are great because you've understood how great they are, but because I think you feel like they've understood you as a person. And can the things we make with technology try to understand who we are as humans, as a society? And this is what I really mean by artful design. It's something we strive to do in everything we do. For example, in building instruments for the laptop orchestra, which consists of humans, a lot of laptops, sitting on uh, audio interfaces, on a breakfast tray. We sit on meditation mats and pillows. And we have special speakers that we fashioned out of IKEA salad bowls. <laughs> Why do we do that? Well, we did that to make the sound emanate locally from the instrument, from the computer that's actually generating it. Why do we do that? Well, because we value something still about how traditional acoustic instruments make sound. They're physical. If I were to play like a violin in front of you on the stage, with amplification, it would come from the artifact and not from the PA system. There's something, well, valuable in that. And we want to kind of combine this thing that we value with, of course, the new possibilities of the computer to generate sound and make fantastical automations and new interactions. This is just one of 200 pieces in the laptop orchestra that's been performed to date. This is a slork in the Bing Concert Hall, a piece called Twilight. In this particular excerpt, we're using an instrument that senses the location of our hand and we're metaphorically pulling a sound out of the ground. front. This is a musical city designed by my PhD student, Kang Woo Kim. In this musical city, well, dusk becomes night as the stars come out, but then the buildings come alive, but with music. Every building can be controlled to affect musical parameters, and they all kind of vibe together. Now the Ferris wheel controls tempo. So now things are really starting to pick up. And you kind of see everything moves at their own musical pace. Hey, there's a plane in the background. And there are going to be cars and vehicles. And things really start livening up. And at some point, 
we go to the moon. And on the moon, there are two rabbits. Why are the rabbits on the moon? I can't tell you. I don't think Kung Wu can tell you, but there they are, making kind of a musical stew. And from there, a railroad track emerges. And on this railroad track, trains carrying musical chords start to flow. I don't know about you, but this puts me at peace. It brings a kind of calm. And it makes me think, you know what? I wouldn't mind living in this city. I wouldn't mind living in a world that would have this kind of city, right? And even UFOs come out of the sky and join in the chorus. And they play little marimbas. And at, at the end of the night, everything peacefully turns off and the next day is ready to begin. Design is all about choices, right? All of these things went through countless choices to be made. And I think what I wanna say is that, what that means is that actually we cannot help but really tackle this question. How do we design ethically? And what does it even mean to design ethically? We might think of ethics and technology as, well, we don't wanna do harm. That's certainly necessary. But to do no evil actually seems like a really low bar, if that's your only bar, right? <laughs> Can we shape technology to proactively do good? And what does good mean in that case? For us, we try to use this as a guiding question. How do we want to live with our technologies? How do we want to live, period? And how can we shape technology in ways that support this kind of aesthetic vision? for the way things ought to be, and just get a little bit closer to that ideal. In this view, tomorrow's designers, well, have, they have to be much more than a specialist, but a kind of technological artist, a moral ethical inventor, and a system designer who not only builds the thing, but really builds the thing with the understanding of how that thing might fit into a greater system, into society, into our world. In higher ed, we have the notion of a I-shaped student. This is a student who specializes in just one discipline. We're like, well, we don't want that. So then we're like, we should maybe have like T-shaped students. You have some depth, you have some breadth. I would like to talk about the pie-shaped student. <laughs> the pie-shaped student on one leg is a disciplinary expertise, for example, computer science. On the other leg is a kind of domain expertise, something you apply your discipline to. For me, it was music. For someone, it could be pub public health. But this bar, this bar on top, is what I would call the aesthetic lens. It's a philosophical, artistic, moral lens that gives broader meaning and context in bridging these two legs. Is this not the kind of student we might want to educate here at Stanford? Is this not the kind of person we ourselves maybe want to strive to be, right? In a way, that is, I think, for me, kind of part of our educational mission is to, is to really educate the full person, full citizens, by giving them the tools with which to fashion themselves. And we're doing this in a number of classes. I teach this under a graduate class called Design That Understands Us, right? And by the way, I put all this into a comic book, <laughs> which starts in my office, takes us through Bing and to various designs. And by the way, this too is research. Um, the design of buildings, everyday things like pencil bags, visual design, instrument and interface design from the theremin to artificial intelligence systems with humans designed into the loop. Games is more than entertainment but a mode of expression and mode of reflection to social design, design that connect us and to think about what are the values, what do we really want from our social tools. Just one final music example. This is a social karaoke app. In the day, it was called Glee Karaoke. And, uh, and like Ocarina, you can listen to other people sing around the world. But you can, anyone who hears this can add their voice in a plus one kind of way into this world anonymous chorus. Now, a woman reached out in the wake of the 2011 uh, tsunami and earthquake disaster. And she, from Tokyo, sang a rendition of a Lean On Me. And she invited the world to join in song. And uh, in a matter of weeks, 4,000 people joined in from all over the globe. This is what it sounds like when it's about 1,000 people.
So what does this all mean? Right? I think what it means is that the things we make today will come back to make us. The things we design and shape technology and how we do it will boomerang back and shape us as individuals and as societies. What we make makes us. And so this, in a nutshell, is what I work on. It's a kind of design for human flourishing, asking what it means for us to flourish as individuals and as a society. And this is artful design. Thank you very much.